hello guys welcome to this uh, review session let's start with the definition for converging networks converged network can carry multiple services of data voice and video all, all together on one link between different types of devices so carrying multiple services on one link uh, is unlike what we had with legacy dedicated networks separate link for voice separate link for data and separate link for video whereas in converged networks they can deliver all between different types of devices over the same network infrastructure meaning that the whole network infrastructure uses the same set of rules and standards next up four basic characteristics of a reliable network very important we expect a reliable network to be fault tolerant firstly secondly to be scalable thirdly to respect quality of service and fourthly to be secure so these four are characteristics of a reliable network fault tolerance scalability quality of service and security so the underlying architecture need to address to these four in order to meet user expectations with fault tolerance we would like to limit the impact of failure so a fault tolerant network limits the impact of failure by limiting the number of affected devices let's say it's link goes down uh, we want to see how we can enroute around the uh, failed segment so in that way we want to limit the number of affected devices and we want the whole network to keep carrying uh, traffic for users even if uh, one segment uh, experiences a failure for that we need of course multiple paths and when we have multiple multiple physical paths in place then if one goes down uh, another one can take over so this form of redundancy with multiple paths can help for uh, reliable networks so reliable networks they provide redundancy by implementing a packet switch network versus the circuit switched networks because with circuit switch networks we need to have dedicated circuits and that means if one goes down we can't do anything really so we cannot provide our reliability is such there but with packet switch networks because of the fact that we split traffic into packets and packets are routed over a network they can take different routes each packet could theoretically take a different route path uh, to get to destination and that means that uh, they can find their way out of the network in in case of congestion or in case of failure for a segment within that network so in order to have redundancy to provide fault tolerance for a reliable network it's important that we implement a packet switch network and we split traffic into packets that are rooted over a network and as i said each packet theoretically can take a different path to 
a destination. Bear in mind that this is impossible with circuit switched uh, networks where we have already established dedicated circuits. Secondly, for a network to be reliable, we want that network to be scalable too. So scalability is the second characteristic of a reliable network. Scalability, of course, without degrading the performance. Third characteristic is quality of service, of course. Quote is the primary mechanism used to ensure reliable delivery of content for all users. This is the basic definition for quality of service. Finally, and fourthly, a reliable network needs to be secure. And when we say security, we're talking about two main types of network security mainly here. First, network infrastructure security and second the information security so they are both very important and there are two main types of network security uh, that we need to cater for bear in mind that technologies like IPS may be used intrusion prevention systems uh, IPS are IPSs are used uh, to identify fast spreading threats such as zero-day attacks. For configuring a network operating system, there are four methods in order to access iOS. We can take advantage of console port, secondly SSH, thirdly Telnet, and fourthly, the auxiliary. It is important to know the differences between these four types of access to iOS. With console port, the first one, remember that console port is out of band mechanism. And this is unlike the other three methods, access methods that we have here. Console port as an out of band mechanism is primarily used for management purposes, such as the initial, very initial configuration for the router uh, through a serial port. So, console port is a serial port. The second approach we have secure shell or SSH. SSH, unlike console port, is an inbound mechanism in order to remotely and securely establish a CLI session over a network. The difference between SSH and Telnet is very important to remember that SSH is secure, whereas Telnet is not. This means that user authentication, password, and even commands that you're issuing, they're all sent over network with SSH while they are encrypted. And that's why, as a best practice, it is highly recommended that in a network, you use SSH instead of a telnet. Telnet, well, it's an inbound interface, similar to SSH, but unlike console port. And it is used in order to remotely establish a CLI session, but through virtual interfaces over a network. So Telnet relies on virtual interfaces. As I said, it is insecure, meaning that user authentication, passwords, and commands that you're issuing, they're all sent over the network in plain text. So unlike SSH, they are not encrypted. And the fourth type of iOS access method is auxiliary port. Auxiliary port 
is considered as a legacy method, method at the moment, so it's an older method for establishing a CLI session remotely. But this time, via telephone dial up connection using a modem. So it makes use of telephone dial up connection using modem, and it's uh, you, it, it was used in all the scenarios. So, for a switch to be remotely managed, it must also be configured with an IP configuration. But the point is, a switch does not have a physical inter Ethernet interface as we have with routers. So when a switch does not have a physical Ethernet interface that can be used for remote management, we need to rely on another method. And that method is that you must configure VLAN 1 of that switch virtual interface SVI. So we have SVI switch virtual interface associated with VLAN 1 and you need to, to provide IP addressing for that so that you can manage your switch remotely that means that your vlan1 switch virtual interface svi must be configured with an ip address in order to uniquely identify that specific switch on the network and that ip address needs of course a subnet mask which identifies the network and host portion in the ip address and that svi uh, VLAN 1 SVI needs to be enabled as well with no shutdown command uh, at the end. So remember VLAN 1 SVI needs to be addressed uh, because that switch does not have physical Ethernet interface if you wish to uniquely identify that switch and remotely manage it. Next up, we want to talk about network protocols and communication. Let's first start talking about standards organizations. Two important ones to remember, ICANN and IANA. So Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, ICANN, and IANA stands for Internet Assigned Numbers Authority. In fact, ICANN uh, coordinates the IP address allocation and IANA performs the allocation itself. Three different things that IANA allocates and takes care of. IP address allocation, domain names allocation, port numbers, TCP, UDP port numbers allocation, these three are dealt with by IANA and behind IANA we have ICANN as the umbrella organization. So it is important to remember that IANA they do the job for ICANN so the allocation name and address IP address and domain name management and protocol identi identifiers they taken care of by IANA or ICANN. Next up we've got OSI reference model and then we have internet model or TCP IP reference model. A protocol suite, very important to know the definition for it, it's a set of protocols that work together in order to provide comprehensive network communication services. In terms of OSI reference model, these protocols that work together can be application protocol, presentation protocol, session protocol, transfer protocol, network protocol, and uh, data link, and finally physical layer. These seven, from top to bottom, as I just named them, they work together to provide comprehensive network communication services. 
when we are in application layer, top layer, seventh layer, we are talking about processes. So in effect, application layer on a source node tries to talk to application layer on a destination node and that means process to process communication. Then we have sixth layer, presentation. That layer deals with the present representation and presentation of data. We may have different dialogues between two nodes and these are taken care of by session layer, fifth layer, which organizes the dialogues. Then we have transfer layer fourth layer we may need to segment our data if it's too much or it's too big and then later on destination node we may need to reassemble them so segmentation and reassembly are the task of transfer layer and then we have network layer the actual transfer or the actual exchange services they are residing within network layer then the second layer is data link layer where data is called frames and within data layer we want to see frame exchange over a common media let's say copper or wireless media then the lowest layer is physical layer and that layer is in fact in charge of transmitting bits between source and destination and also removing of the removal of the bits from the media uh, and the destinations. This is also a reference model, and then we've got TCP/IP reference model, short and form. Uh, TCP/IP model is also called Internet model, and it has only application transport, internet, and network access. So fourth application, third transport second layer internet and the first layer uh, network access network access is is in fact a combination of osi physical and osi data link layers internet layer corresponds to network layer of osi transport is the same name uh, that we have in both referencing reference models and then application in tcp ip is in charge of what we had as application presentation and session layers with osi reference model as user data or as application data is passed down the protocol stack some information is added at each level this process is known as encapsulation encapsulation works like letter and envelope so you put letter inside envelope and then you add some information on envelope this is exactly what happens with the encapsulation networking so we add some header and trailer to the beginning and the end of some data and then we pass it down to the next la layer or level and this 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 process is called encapsulation so let's say layer 4 data let's say TCP segment is encapsulated and delivered to uh, layer 3 and layer 3 also adds its own header and then that data is called packet or becomes packet with some packet header at the beginning and some trailer at the end ip packet in turn is encapsulated in what we know as ethernet layer or ethernet layer frame and the same process happens the encapsulation is the opposite is the process when you get data from the media on the receiving side and then by receiving device you start removing one or more of the protocol headers as you pass up data or information 
from lower layers to uh, higher layers. This is important to know the definition for protocol data unit PDU. The form that the data takes at each layer is known as PDU. By now you should know about data which is PDU for application layer. You should know about segment which is PDU for transfer layer. Packet is the name that you use with the network layer so packet is PDU with network layer. Frame data link layer PDU and bits are physical layer PDU. Once again, encapsulation process works from top to bottom and de-encapsulation process works from bottom to top where you start removing the headers. Whereas with encapsulation, you already added headers. Next stop, when a sender and a receiver, they are both on the same network, then we don't have a problem for finding out the destination MAC address, adding the new layer to frame header and sending the frame out. But when sending to a remote network, meaning that the source IP address and destination IP address, they are on different network and represent hosts on different networks, then that means layer two frames, they cannot be sent directly to remote destination MAC address. In fact, we don't know about the exact destination MAC address if it's not within the local network and it's residing uh, on, a res on a remote network. That simply means that we need to use what we know as default gateway, and that is nearest router interface, because it's the router job. Recall that routers allow creation of internetwork, and now we need internetwork to travel from the local network to remote network. What would happen when we send the frame to uh, the default gateway? Default gateway is in fact a router interface and that router is responsible for removing the received layer 2 information and adding the new layer 2 information before forwarding out exit interface towards the remote network. Next stop is network access. We're going to talk in details about layer one and layer two. Layer one, it accepts a complete frame from layer two and then encodes it as a series of signals that are transmitted onto the local media. The definition for encoding is important. It's a method of converting a stream of data bits into a predefined code. The purpose of encoding is to transform data. Transform data so that data can be properly and safely consumed by another system or a different type of system. For instance, binary data, we see that it can be sent over email thanks to encoding, or we can see and view, let's say, special characters on a web page thanks to encoding. I've seen some people, they are confused encoding with encryption. The goal with encoding is not to keep the information secret, but rather to ensure that information is able to be properly consumed. 
that's why encoding has to do with transforming data into another format so this transformation is important and that's why with encoding the scheme that we're using is publicly available and it can be easily reversed so it doesn't require any sort of keys cryptographic keys and as long as we know the algorithm we can decode it back to the original form or original format some examples of encoding include ASCII, Unicode, URL encoding, and BASE64. While these examples, they talk about encoding from higher OSI layers, viewpoints, let's say from application layer, when we are talking about URL encoding, here with network access, layer one we are talking about converting or transforming again for a stream of data bits into a predefined code so similar concept but a different layer when we are talking about our local media or media three basic forms of network media are intended the first category is relying on electrical signals the second one light pulses and the third category microwave signals or wireless media this brings the next concept here signaling method the method by which we represent the bits and it is defined based on different layer one standards so layer one standards are there to define what type of signals represents let's say a one or a zero method of representing the bits is our signaling method the subtle difference between uh, encoding and signaling sometimes make it difficult for some learners to distinguish between these two concepts signaling discusses how physical layer must generate electrical optical or wireless signals in order to represent one and zero and the media the method of representing the bits is called therefore the signaling method so the method can be based on voltage current rf radio frequency or light one of these methods is used in order to represent one or zero for instance, I can say a 1 is 5 volts or a 0 is 0 volts. This is signaling and this is my signaling method based on voltage. Encoding, however, is how the 1s and the zeros will be used later. So, for example, one can say a 1 means on and a zero means off so on and off this is encoding encoding or line encoding in physical layer therefore is defined as a method of converting a stream of data bits into a predefined code codes are groupings of bits in this definition and this groupings of bits is used to provide a predictable pattern that can be recognized by both the sender and the receiver so if the signaling is re relying on the voltage then with encoding 
a pattern of voltage or a pattern of current is used or are used in order to represent different groupings of bits. Another good example to differentiate between encoding and signaling is the Morse code. So we use Morse code whereby signal can be sound or can be pulse or can be light but the message itself is encoded using the bits and thus so the short or long pulses are called beats and does uh, just synonym for dots and dashes anyway in fiber optics for instance we can say long pulse might represent a one whereas a short pulse represents a zero next stop is modulation and this concept is very important for wireless communication modulation is defined as the process by which the characteristic of one wave known as signal modifies another wave known as carrier we then move on to definition for bandwidth shown as bw here bandwidth is defined as the capacity of a medium to carry data digital bandwidth measures the amount of data that can flow over the medium from one place to another in a given amount of time so amount of data in given amount of time the important takeaway point for you is that bandwidth is not equal to speed because sometimes bandwidth is thought of as the speed that bits travel this is not correct this is not accurate for example in both 10 megabit per second as well as 100 megabit per second ethernet medium we're going to have bits that are sent at the speed of electricity no matter which bandwidth we're talking about bits are sent at the speed of electricity the difference between 10 megabit per second uh, from 100 megabit per second is that the number of bits that are transmitted per second is different with each of these two media and that's why we define bandwidth as the capacity of the medium to carry data and is measured based on the amount of data that can flow from one place to another in a given amount of time the definition for bandwidth brings us to the next definition that is throughput while in bandwidth we are talking about amount of traffic or amount of data that can flow and it is more to do with the potential of the medium in throughput we are talking about actual transfer and that's why we measure the actual transfer of bits across the media over a given period of time as throughput measurement and the important point here is that throughput usually does not match what we see as the specified bandwidth for the physical layer. And this is due to different factors, including the amount of traffic, the type of traffic, the latency created by network devices encountered between the source and the destination, all these factors and elements contribute to the fact that the throughput usually does not match the specified bandwidth in 
uh, layer one implementations. Next up is good put. So throughput was defined as the actual transfer of bits over time. Good put, however, is defined as throughput minus traffic overhead. We consider traffic for establishing sessions or traffic for acknowledgements or traffic for encapsulation as traffic overhead and that's why good put is defined as throughput minus this overhead or minus traffic overhead more about network access data link layer or layer 2 is divided into two sub layers llc and mac so llc stands for logical link control and MAC stands for media access control. This topic is very important. So OSI layer three network, below that we got the data link and data link layer has two sub layers, LLC sub layer and MAC sub layer. And then we have layer one or physical. The first observation from this figure on the top is that as you can see different ieee standards like 802.3 for ethernet 802.11 for famous wi-fi and 802.15 bluetooth standard they're all covering physical layer up to max sub layer and llc sub layer seats on top of these standards so this is very important In other words, no matter which IEEE standard we are talking about, like Ethernet or Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, LLC sublayer is the same for all these different technologies. However, these different technologies, they all define the Mac sublayer and physical layer associated with them when we define ethernet we define it as a collection of standards and protocols and technologies to do with layer one and layer two of osi and remember when we say that a more accurate thing is to say ethernet for instance is layer one and layer two max sub layer technologies and standards while LLC sublayer is the same for different uh, IEEE standards such as 802.3, 802.11 or 802.15 next we would like to discuss the responsibilities for these two sublayers LLC is there to communicate with the upper layers, network layer for instance, and LLC identifies which network layer protocol in particular is being used for the frame. LLC allows multiple layer 3 protocols such as IP version 4 and IP version 6 to utilize the same network interface and the same network media. So to conclude, thanks to this LLC sublayer, higher layers of OSI model, they do not care if the underlying technology is Ethernet or Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. They don't need to change because they know that no matter which LLC is there to allow multiple layer 3 protocols to utilize the same network interface and media. Then we have media access control or max sub layer that defines the media access processes performed by the hardware. 
remember that we are talking about very low layers of OSI uh, where we need to directly access the hardware and the media so defines the media access Mac also provides data link layer addressing ie Mac addresses and access to different network technologies like Wi-Fi or Bluetooth they all use uh, data link layer addressing Mac communicates with Ethernet in this particular case 802.3 standard in order to send and receive frames over a copper or fiber optic cable to different types of media here copper or fiber optic similarly mac communicates with wireless technologies like 802.11 or 802.15 once again LLC sublayer remains the same no matter which underlying technologies we have Ethernet, be it Wi-Fi, be it Bluetooth and it's in fact Max job or Max sublayer's job to communicate with Ethernet for instance to send and receive frames over copper or fiber optic 802.3 standard or uh, communicating with wireless technologies 802.11 for Wi-Fi or 802.15 for Bluetooth in the below figure towards the bottom of the slide what we have is the header and trailer for data link layer remember that the violet color used here on the top figure is showing data link and in the bottom figure data link header data link trailer and the fields contained in the header and trailer they're all shown in violet color this is used to show the structure of the frame so we are in layer 2 the PDU is called frame and the structure of the frame and the fields contained in the header and trailer are shown here in at, towards the bottom of this slide this is structure for the fields in the header and trailer it depends on layer 3 protocol For IP, the header includes frame start field, some addressing information, type field, control field, and the trailer contains error detection and frame stop. So, in general, the frame fields can be described as such. At each hop, along the path and when I say hop think of a router so at each router or hop along the path what a router does is first to accept the frame from a medium secondly to de-encapsulate that frame thirdly to re-encapsulate the packet into a new frame and fourthly to forward the new frame appropriate to the medium of the next segment segment so this is important to know that this encapsulation and de-encapsulation at data link layer happens at each hop and may change according to the uh, medium that we have for the next segment before forwarding it so once again we accept a frame from a medium we then de-encapsulate the frame we then re-encapsulate the packet into a new frame and that's when we need to think of the next medium so new frame appropriate to the next medium and fourthly and finally 
we forward that new frame uh, that is now appropriate to the medium of the next segment of the network. This process happens at each hop along the path from the source to the very end destination. The segment technology, be it Wi-Fi, be it Ethernet, be it Bluetooth, whatever it is, that in fact determines the layer 2 protocol that is used for encapsulation, de-encapsulation or re-encapsulation. This is very important. So the layer 2 protocol that we are using for encapsulation for a next segment or for next medium is determined by the technology that we are using in that segment or in that new medium. And that is going to tell us how the new frame is going to be established. So data link layer protocols include Ethernet, 802.11 wireless, point to point protocol PPP, HDLC, frame relay, whatever it is, before forwarding a receipt frame to the next segment with any of these uh, technologies like Ethernet or wireless or PPP, we need to re-encapsulate the received frame into a new frame according to the technology of the next segment. The structure of the frame and the fields containing the header and trailer, once again, that of course depends on layer 3 protocol and if it's IP uh, we're going to have the structure that you can see here with frame start and frame stop indicator flags uh, identifying the beginning or the end limits for the frame we're going to have some addressing fields indicating the source and destination nodes and then we're going to have type and within type frame field we're going to specify the layer 3 protocol that we have inside the data field some control information to identify special flow control services such as quality of service and data field inside the frame that contains the frame payload and frame payload in turn it contains packet header segment header and the data itself so layer 3 header layer 4 header and data next up i'm going to talk about ethernet Ethernet protocol is defined as the most commonly used LAN technology in the world. When we are talking about Ethernet, we are not just talking about a single layer of OSI model. Instead, Ethernet is a combination of not only data link layer software, but also physical layer layer one hardware so a combination of data link layer and physical layer together uh, can be used in order to describe ethernet so remember this is due to the fact that physical and data link layers are tightly coupled and as a result of that ethernet is defined in ieee 802.2 for LLC sublayer and 802.3 for max sublayer as well as physical layer standards. Recall that data link layer has two sublayers, LLC Mac, and the main responsibilities for max sublayer include data encapsulation according to the 
technology that is used for the next segment and the next segment's topology. And the second responsibility for Max Update is a media access control, how to access media that is defined by Max Update. Addressing is the same as MAC addresses that we know with Ethernet. We need MAC addresses with other uh, standards like Wi Fi or Bluetooth, but they are unique to Ethernet networks, meaning that serial interfaces they don't rely on MAC addresses. So, serial interfaces they do not have MAC addresses, and of course, the media access as a responsibility of Mac sub-layer. LLC sub-layer handles the communication between upper layers and the lower layers. The important point about LLC is that LLC, unlike Mac, is implemented in software and therefore its implementation or LLC's implementation is independent of the hardware. So, refer to the previous discussion that we had. Max sublayer remains the same on the top of different IEEE standards for Mac plus physical layer, uh, be it IEEE 802.3, 802.11, 802.12. This is the reason because LLC's implementation is in software and therefore its implementation is independent of the hardware or underlying technology that we are using for our topology. The Mac sub layer constitutes the lower layer of the data link layer. And unlike LLC, Mac is implemented by hardware. The place to find Mac is your NIC and I see card, network interface card, where you can see Mac is implemented in hardware. The Mac sublayers, two responsibilities were mentioned data encapsulation as well as media access control or Mac as the name suggests. Data encapsulation provides three primary functions, frame delimiting, addressing as I mentioned, the MAC address is often referred to as a burned in address, BIA, BIA. So burned in address means that the address is encoded into the ROM chip permanently. So no matter what, the MAC address or BIA address remains the same for the device. It is not changing because this address is encoded permanently into ROM chip. As soon as your machine starts up or your computer comes up, the first thing that network interface card does or NIC does is to copy the MAC or BIA address from your ROM memory into RAM memory or from, from read-only memory into random access memory. So this is addressing as the second primary function of data encapsulation responsibility for Mac and the third primary function is error detection. We will see shortly CRC. Then we have the second responsibility for Mac sublayer, and that is media access control. Media access control is responsible for placement of frames on the media and remove the removal of frames from the media. So placement on the media and removal from the media. This sublayer, Mac sublayer needs to communicate directly with the physical layer. Therefore, Mac sublayer's implementation really depends on the medium 
or physical layer standard that we are having. So we cannot say that similar to LLC, it remains the same no matter which underlying technology we're using, wireless or Ethernet or Bluetooth. Here it really depends and it varies according to the underlying technology. Media access as the second responsibility for Mac sub layer is important because it imposes control. So media access control is equivalent of traffic rules that regulate the entrance of motor vehicles onto a roadway, let's say. So this is analogous to this example of motor vehicles entrance onto a roadway. The absence of any media access control or any match rules there would be the equivalence of vehicles ignoring all other traffic, thinking about themselves only, and entering the road without regard to other vehicles. And guess what? The result of this is collision. However, not all roads and entrances are the same, and therefore traffic can enter the road by merging sometimes, by waiting for its turn at a stop sign sometimes, or sometimes by obeying signal lights. The exact thing happens with networking. A driver needs to follow a different set of rules for each of for each type of uh, entrance before joining a roadway and here with networking we have the same we have media access control that defines how the placement of frames on the media and removal of frames from the media should be happening so the takeaway point for you is that the Mac media access control responsibility of Mac sub layer is analogous to traffic rules that regulate the entrance of motor vehicles onto a roadway. Now let's examine the frame fields for Ethernet. So Ethernet frame fields include preamble, destination MAC address, source MAC address, either type field, data field, and frame check sequence. And remembering this structure is important. So preamble destination MAC comes first before source MAC and then either type data and finally FCS frame check sequence. The original Ethernet IEEE 802.3 standard defined the minimum Ethernet frame size as 64 bytes. IEEE 802.3 standard also defined the maximum Ethernet frame size as 1518, 1518 bytes. This maximum, however, was later increased by 4 bytes to, be, to become 1522, 1522 bytes to allow for VLAN tagging. The first 8 bytes of the frame are used in order to get the attention of the receiving nodes, preamble and start frame delimiter fields, preamble for 7 bytes and SFD or start of frame for 1 byte. So these two fields are used for synchronization purpose between the sending and receiving device. The destination MAC address field has 6 byte length, so 48 bits for MAC address as the identifier for the intended recipient. This field is compared with the BIA or MAC address that our machine just copied from ROM to RAM as soon as it came up and then it gets compared again the destination MAC address in the 
Ethernet frame. If they match, that means that the received frame is intended for us to be received by us. So if there is a match, we accept the frame and the destination MAC address or layer 2 address can be a unicast, can be a multicast, can be a broadcast. Then we have source MAC address that identifies the frames originating interface or the frames originating network interface card. Unlike destination MAC address, source MAC address must always be a unicast address. Next field that we have is a two byte field called either type and the purpose is to identify the upper layer protocol encapsulated within this Ethernet frame. So it can have different values. The common values are for IPv4 protocol or IPv6 protocol or this famous one ARP address resolution protocol ARP protocol. Different values for each of them uh, specifies the upper layer protocol encapsulated within this Ethernet frame. Then the next field is a data field, the minimum size for the Ethernet frame is 64 bytes. That means if a small packet is encapsulated, we need to add an additional bits here to this field. And these additional bits are called a pad. And a pad is used in order to increase the size of the frame to meet the minimum size of 64 bytes for an Ethernet frame. And the last but not the least field in Ethernet frame, frame check sequence FCS. FCS, 4 bytes, is used to detect errors that happens in transit in a frame. So FCS uses what we know as CRC, Cyclic Redundancy Check, CRC. And the way that it uses CRC is that the sending device calculates a CRC and puts the CRC value inside the FCS field of the frame. The receiving side also, it generates a new CRC to look for errors and compares it with the CRC value included in the FCS field of the received frame. If two calculations match, then no error occurred in transit. In transit but if the calculations of these two CRCs, they do not match, that is an indication of the data has been tampered with or has changed and therefore the frame is dropped. A change in data could be a result of a disruption of the electrical signals that represent the bits, so it's not always the attack. We now move on to our next stop that is switching. What is switching? Switching is the process of making decisions. What sort of decisions? Forwarding decisions. And with switching, we want to make forwarding decisions based only on the layer 2 Ethernet MAC address information. So this is important. Whereas in routing, we use layer 3 IP packet addressing information. With layer with switching, we use a layer 2 Ethernet MAC addresses in order to make forwarding decisions. Inside switches, we have MAC table or MAC address table. This table is, is also called CAM table, content addressable memory table. MAC table, CAM table, they are the same concept. And in order to do forwarding decisions, 
switch first needs to learn MAC addresses. So learning happens before forwarding. For learning to happen, switch must examine incoming frames in the search for new source MAC addresses of those frames. So for each incoming frame, a switch examines the source MAC address of that frame. If that source MAC address is unknown to the switch, then switch needs to add that MAC address along with the port on which it was received. For the incoming frame, if the switch has already heard about that specific source MAC address, then all switch needs to do is to refresh the timer corresponding to the entry of MAC plus port in the CAM table for that specific source MAC address. So this is important to remember that there is also a timer associated with each entry or each row inside the CAM or MAC table of the switch for which if we do not hear anything for a specific MAC address inside the table then that row in the table that entry is going to get discarded after this timer has expired so the default is five minutes if for a learned mac address and its port number associated with that we have not heard anything within five minutes we're going to discard it so we assume that it's not valid anymore however if for the given MAC address along with the port number associated with it, we have received a new frame with that source MAC address within five minutes refresh timer. Then we're going to just refree, refresh that timer and keep the information as the information is still valid. These entries inside the CAM table help us to do forwarding. So if a new frame is received and that frame is destined at a specific destination MAC address and that switch has already heard about that MAC address, that means that he knows where to forward out that a specific frame. However, if the destination MAC address is not unicast, i.e. it is broadcast or multicast, that means that the switch wants to flood out that frame all ports except the one on which it was received. So broadcast or multicast is flooded out all except incoming port and this is a split horizon rule again app applicable here but as i said if it's unicast for this nation mac then we know exactly where to see or look we need to look for match inside cam or mac table if we receive a frame for which the destination MAC address is unknown, that means that we again need to forward that frame out all ports except the one on which we have received it. And we just wait for the intended recipient to respond to this frame so that he can also help us with learning where this exact MAC address is attached to the switch. So the takeaway point for you, learning happens before forwarding. As a switch receives frame from different devices, it is able 
to populate its MAC address table or CAM table by examining the source MAC address of every frame and populating the uh, table. Later, when we receive the next frame, the destination MAC address is broadcast or multicast, we just need to flood it out all except the incoming port. If it's unicast, then we look for match in this CAM table. And if it is a known unicast, meaning that it's a unicast destination MAC address of which we have no clue inside CAM table, we just need again to forward out all ports except the one on which we have received. So you know now how switching operates. Next stop, we want to see how the actual forwarding happens. So forwarding methods for switching data between ports, how that's gonna happen. Switches use either store and forward method or cut through forwarding method. With store and forward, it is expected to receive the entire frame first and then to compute cyclic redundancy check CRC value if the switch determines that the CRC is valid then destination lookup happens which determines the outgoing interface or the outgoing port so the key point here is that we first receive the entire frame but with cut through forwarding method switch forwards frame before it is entirely received at minimum what switch needs to understand is the destination mac address so at minimum destination mac must be read as soon as that is read then this the switch can forward the frame cut through forwarding method in turn has two variants fast forward and fragment free switching with cut through fast forward method that is most typically the case we offer the lowest level of latency as the name fast forward suggests this forwarding method immediately forwards the frame after it reads destination MAC address. However, it is prone to errors. And that's why we have another variant here with cut through. We have fragment free switching that is a compromise between store and forward and fast forward switching methods with fragment free switching switch first stores the first 64 bytes of the frame before forwarding it why the first 64 bytes needs to be stored first because it was proved that most errors happens within the first 64 bytes of the frame that's why we first store it and then when we make sure that there is no error in the first 64 bytes we then forward the frame out the outgoing port so that's why fragment free switching is known as a compromise between store and, for store and forward and fast forward switching the point here is that frames less than 64 bytes are called a collision fragment or round frame and therefore are automatically discarded by receiving stations frames greater than 1500 bytes on the other hand are considered jumbo or baby giant frames so fragment free switching as a variant of cut through forwarding method first stores the first 
first 64 bytes of the frame before forwarding it. In order to make sure that that frame is not a collision fragment or runs frame. Remember with fragment free switching, we just care about collision fragment or run frame. We do not do the whole CRC check uh, over the entire size of the frame. We just check the first 64 bytes to make sure that it is not categorized as collision fragment or run frame, meaning that it's bigger than 64 bytes. If it is not, then just forward it. Next up is address resolution protocol R protocol. We have the IP address information for the destination, but we don't know the associate MAC address. In order to find MAC address corresponding to an IP address that we know, we need ARP to be in place, address resolution protocol. And for that, we have ARP cache in the RAM memory. Again, inside that cache memory, we're going to have ARP table in which the entries tell us the IP addresses, the known IP addresses, and the associated MAC addresses. If the destination IP address is in the same network as source IP address, then all we need to do is to search inside the ARP table to find out the corresponding MAC address to destination IP address. If, however, the destination IP address is in a remote network than the local source IP address, then all we need to do is to search for default gateways IP addresses corresponding MAC address. In other words, we need to send the frame to the default gateway and for that we need to know the MAC address of the default gateways interface uh, we already know about the default gateway IP address, so we just ask our table to tell us the corresponding MAC address to that uh, IP address of the default gateway. So we have our request that is a broadcast frame when we don't know the MAC address associated to a known IP address. We broadcast our request frame and that is sent in order to, to discover the MAC address associated with an IP address. If there is no entry in the ARP cache memory, then that means that we want to ask who has the MAC address associated with a given IP address. ARP messages, very important, are encapsulated directly within Ethernet frame. So recall that Ethernet frame has one field called either type, and inside either type, we are specifying the upper layer protocol that that frame is carrying. And in this case, with ARP, it's not going to be IPv4 header, it's not going to be IPv6 header, it's directly referring to ARP protocol, so that's why we say ARP messages are encapsulated directly within an Ethernet frame, and there is no IPv4 header for ARP requests. The Snatch MAC address for ARP requests is broadcast, as we expect. And only the device with an IPv4 address associated with the target IPv4 address in the ARP request will respond with an ARP reply message. So ARP reply is going to be a unicast sort of communication. Remember that entries inside ARP table are all time stamped. And therefore, if a device does not receive a frame 
from a particular device by the time that the time stamp expires that means that the entry for this device is removed from the ARP table so to sum up ARP requests are broadcast messages ARP replies are unicast messages with ARP there is no IPv4 header in place instead ARP messages are in encapsulated directly within an inter an Ethernet frame and finally entries within ARP table inside the cache memory they're all time stamped to make sure that we always keep up to date and fresh information for the IP MAC bindings now that you know how ARP is operating let's introduce a security attack called ARP spoofing so recall that when we discussed how ARP operates if the destination MAC if the destination IP address is in the remote room network that means that we need to find the MAC address associated with the default gateway and we and if we don't have that information that means that we need to send broadcast ARP requests to find out what the associated MAC address to the default gateway's IP address is attackers at this point of time can respond to broadcast ARP requests and pretend to be providers of services in this case they can pretend to be default gateway so with ARP spoofing attack used by attackers they can reply to an ARP request for the default gateway and from that moment on they can intercept the communication from the victim and the poor victim thinks that he is talking to the default gateway fortunately enterprise level switches they have mitigation techniques in place for this uh, sort of attack of spoofing and the mitigation is known as DAI solution known as dynamic ARP inspection to make sure that no rouge or fake default gateway in other words no attacker is providing false ARP replies to our ARP requests 